to ask the most popular word am i audible i am sure it will be i'm audible <laughs> uh, yes you are yeah okay so uh, uh this paper is about uh, uh, the role of automation and how it is in uh, influencing the global value chain analysis it's a joint work with uh, ketan reddy uh, from iit madras and uh, radeep from iit uh, bilai so uh, uh, here is the outline of my presentation i'll just give you the background of this study and what really motivated us to undertake this and followed by a brief overview of what the literature says and we went down to the data followed by methodology and present the results so uh, uh, to begin with actually the 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 inspiration for this paper is the world development report uh, 2020 which uh, which is basically about the global value chains so the chapter number 6 is about the possibility of automation and uh, trying to link it with uh, the global value chain so that's beside uh, precisely the inspiration for you know writing this paper so if you look at what is happening uh, or what has been happening in the world I mean, like for the last 200 years, since the advent of this uh, industrial revolution, the first industrial revolution, that really led to the, the, the big change in the way the production was organized. And then that had a profound influence on the international trade. So if you, if you uh, look at what has happened, uh, like from the evolution of the steam engine and uh, the rapid advancements in the communication technologies that has led to what is called as the fragmented production networks or it is popularly called as the global value chains so uh, and the rapid technological advancements what we are seeing in the last 20 years or 25 years has a profound impact on the uh, global value chains because if you look at the advancements uh, the, which I will outline it later on uh, has led to a declining trade cost. The trade cost is substantially reduced and uh, the firms are able to upgrade their quality. And also these new technologies have led to uh, improvements in the uh, firm productivity. So all these new type of technologies has a uh, profound impact on the way the global value chains is organized currently. Uh, but more recently, there is a push towards, you know, uh, even more uh, advanced technologies. For example, the much talked about the artificial intelligence, the adoption of uh, robots, uh, 3D printing, uh, the cloud computing, big data, uh, and the Internet of Things. And this is further going to alter the topography of our global value chains. So, so what is uh, uh, if you if you look at uh, I mean if you are not very familiar with this uh, global value chain, uh, actually the global value chain is a kind of a omnipresent uh, trade paradigm. It's no longer the you know the countries are in, engaging in you know trade for the final goods. It's mostly the trade is happening uh, where the parts and components are traded, and then where the where the the trade is between the forms. Uh, the firms forge networks uh, 
you know, a, a firm in US is forging a network with a firm located in Chennai. So this is this is basically the uh, the idea of uh, the global value chains. So as a result of this forging networks, I mean, like the uh, many theoretical models have shown that this can lead to a, a flow of knowledge, right, and the technical know-how, which is really crucial for uh, the uh, improving the productivity. So uh, we know that this kind of technology transfer or the knowledge transfer and the operational expertise is going to generate uh, substantial uh, gains to the firms. And also uh, uh, the GVC is going to, uh, or GVC has actually provided an opportunity for uh, the firms to access the international markets and which will have an impact on the economic growth. So for example, uh, GVC, uh, especially the firms from the developing countries, uh, which are part of the uh, global value chains, a lot of studies have actually shown that it has led to an improvement in their productivity. Uh, there is a, an ambiguous results have shown that the, the firms which are part of the global value chains are uh, more productive than the firms which are not part of the global value chains. So uh, the literature which uh, has studied the global value chains has mostly looked at the productivity aspects or what are the constraints for the firms, uh, especially the role of financial constraints has been looked at. Uh, probably we have a, a, a keynote today evening, which is uh, exactly going to talk about this issue. And also, uh, you know, the other determinants of GVC participation, like the foreign ownership, etc. So, uh, however, what has happened is, uh, if you see the recent advancements, the ones which I talked about, the robotization uh, or the more advanced manufacturing technologies or the additive manufacturing technologies have sort of uh, raised some concerns about the trade itself, right? It, it, for example, if you see, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, so, uh, so if you see the uh, new automation technologies like AI or cloud computing or big data or IOT or 3D printing can, as I mentioned, can alter the topography of the global value chains. So, so, uh, so this, this kind of technologies is going to uh, lead to the creation of new products, uh, especially the firms are uh, going to benefit a lot from these technologies because, because they can actually, these technologies can help them to uh, upgrade their quality and uh, which is crucial for, you know, becoming uh, embedded in the global value chains. So, uh, but at the same time, I mean, some of the uh, economists, uh, especially uh, a famous paper by Roderick uh, has actually raised some concerns about uh, uh, these kind of technologies. And also he lists uh, uh, some opportunities as well. Uh, so for, for example, like uh, some of the risk uh, is especially for any kind of advanced uh, production technology, it's more likely that it's, uh, it's basically the, uh, the developed countries which are going to, or the firms from developing, uh, developed countries which are going to benefit uh, far more than uh, the developing country firms. Right, uh, it, it might take uh, a lot of time for these technologies to diffuse to the uh, developing economy. So, the, so he argues that basically this is going to benefit uh, mostly the firms from um, the developed economies. And the other concern is regarding this automation is what we are going to witness is more uh, the reason why the firms are, you know, uh, sort of transferring a part of the production process outside their home country is because of some cost advantages in a particular location. But the automation is uh, going to bring those outsourcing or the offshoring back to the home country itself, what we call it as the reshoring. So therefore the length of the GVC is likely to be shortened. And also, I mean, a related literature, of course, the impact of automation has been much studied by, uh, from the labor market perspective. And uh, the role of uh, automation on the trade has been a recent phenomenon. In the last two years, only the, uh, the trade economists have uh, started, uh, you know, 
studying these issues using the empirical data and building theoretical models. So much of this has been on the impact on the labor market. But at the same time, uh, I mean, it's, it's not the doomsday uh, uh, scenario. Uh, he also mentions that there are opportunities for uh, the firms. I mean, this is basically a kind of a, um, opportunity for the developing countries firms to sort of leapfrog into the more advanced status and it will enable them to get an opportunity to uh, become an integral part of the global value chains. So there are, uh, you know, both the risks and the opportunities uh, 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 for as a part of the uh, automation and its impact on the trade, especially on the GVCs. So, so uh, what what is happening is that uh, a combination of uh, these two effects, the risk and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Basically, the idea is that the automation is going to uh, reinforce the productivity. I mean, like in the sense that. It, there are a, a lot of uh, papers which argue that the automation is more likely to benefit the large firms because the automation, uh, undertaking automation uh, inc uh, incurs uh, a fixed cost upfront and only those firms which have deep pockets can uh, sort of make investments in, in such uh, kind of advanced technologies. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the firms can actually uh, enjoy the scale effects right so for for example uh, the the automation can result in uh, result in the firm's expansion uh, uh, which leads to an increase in the demand for inputs uh, sourced from the uh, other lower income countries in fact there is uh, uh, some evidence uh, which i'm going to tell you uh, uh, for this kind of a phenomenon so uh, <clears throat> So, uh, uh, I mean, moving on to the, uh, you know, sort of uh, from this background uh, to the uh, literature, I, I mentioned in the beginning itself that the GVC uh, literature has been sort of from predominantly looking at the role of productivity or the ownership or the size or the financial constraints, uh, the role of innovative ability because innovation plays a key role in the GVC participation uh, and that and especially the the new age technology something like the adoption of uh, automation and its impact on the GVC is a kind of a, uh, a na nascent kind of a literature which has come up in fact there is a paper by uh, Paul Andras uh, ju just published in the World Bank Economic Review where he's actually talking about the need of undertaking, uh, you know, such kind of uh, empirical work uh, using the firm level data to understand the uh, impact of automation on the GVC participation of the firm. So this is a kind of a, uh, an area which is still very nascent, uh, hardly few studies uh, which has actually looked at this issue explicitly. So if you look at uh, uh, the automation literature, Right? It's, it has been mostly on the labor market dynamics and rightly so, because there is a lot, a lot of concern uh, about what is called as the technological unemployment, uh, where the labor is going to be displaced as a result of these kind of task-based technologies like uh, uh, the new age automation technologies. So, so the, the, the trade issue, especially the role of uh, GVC has been a kind of a, uh, in the back burner all this while because predominantly it has been dominated by the question of the uh, the labor market uh, adjustments so so what uh, we are actually doing is you know trying to contribute to this uh, you know embryonic strand of literature looking at the role of uh, automation in gvc participation uh, using a firm level data so uh, <clears throat> Now, what we are, uh, when you look at the uh, literature, right, uh, we actually contribute to the three strands of literature. So, for example, like uh, we look at the role of technology adoption. So, what we, we, we actually contribute to the three strands of literature. One is basically uh, looking at the role of uh, um, <clears throat> essentially, there are three teams connecting our uh, study. One is basically the new production technology adoption. 
and then uh, uh, second is basically trying to you know connect this automation to the trade literature which has been uh, a recent phenomenon so uh, uh, if you if you if you see what what is happening is over the uh, past uh, two and a half centuries uh, the radical changes has been brought about through innovation and which has an impact on the uh, production and the global trade uh, i mentioned this in the beginning itself you know starting from the steam engine to the electricity to the information technology had a profound impact on the global trade so uh, <clears throat> this is uh, of course this these kind of technologies had an impact on the gvc participation but then this new age uh, technology is what i just talked about is further going to have a you know uh, is going to further alter the landscape of this kind of uh, uh, global value chains so these new production technologies the origins uh, of what we call it as the industry 4.0 it, it began in germany this term uh, is known in different names like uh, industry 4.0 advanced manufacturing technologies uh, so many uh, titles are given for this or the fourth wave of industrial uh, industrialization is uh, which is pushed through the adoption of uh, digital technologies Uh, led to the creation of this industry 4.0 so the industry 4.0 is basically trying to sort of connect the disjointed uh, uh, production uh, using an it backed network so so basically you can actually see that the in industry uh, we, we have actually transformed from uh, you know a system where everything was produced in house uh, to you know sort of uh, move to a factory system then to a kind of kind of a computerized system where we have now reached the level of industry 4.0 which is basically a, a kind of an uh, digital technology or the it backed network which is going to give the competitive advantage to the firms in the long term so from a manufacturing uh, perspective the what is the role of automation so what we did is like you know we try to look at the kind of uh, literature which is there in the supply chain management literature where they uh, you know have done kind of some kind of a studies mostly these are uh, case studies uh, from uh, different countries using uh, either case studies or smaller sample of studies so from a manufacturing perspective right uh, i mean there is a lot of uh, people who have been talking about uh, 3d printing even though that's not my widely adopted that's going to uh, or the uh, the robots uh, if you look at the robotization data it it it's actually increasing even in india like it's uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, especially uh, some of the uh, high technology industries like uh, electronics or um, automobile sector uh, the robotization is on uh, at a very high speed so you can actually see that that these kind of technologies is going to enhance the quality because you can actually have a precise inputs and then what is important in a supply chain is if you are a supplier to a kind of a lead form they need the, the consistency throughout right so and then the other part is this kind of technology is going to offer a lot of flexibility in the production so so uh, especially something like 3d printing is going to have a specific uh, individual and needs of a consumer which could be taken into consideration like uh, unlike uh, the shoes which are made uh, for mass production right it can be a shoe which is meant for just my type of uh, a leg i mean it's specifically new uh, suiting the need of a specific consumer and also uh, what we call it as a digital supply chain it's it's much easier to track these intermediate goods like uh, the digital supply chain is all about uh, you know you can sort of simulate this kind of environment which can uh, track and trace these intermediate goods uh, especially for pawns which are actually sourcing uh, these inputs from different countries this is really uh, an important development right they, they are, unlike uh, earlier system it's much easier to the track and trace uh, this intermediate goods 
due to this kind of uh, you know uh, digital technologies and also inventory management i mean all these things we have taken from the supply chain uh, literature so the uh, the integration of these uh, advanced manufacturing techniques or the additive manufacturing techniques enables the firm to you know, you know manage their uh, inventories efficiently and this is something the inventory management is very crucial uh, especially in the case of the fragmented production so uh, uh, and then uh, the gvc is not only about the manufacturing the services are important component of the gvc in fact there is a, another parallel literature which is slowly emerging is uh, the servicification of the gvcs many manufacturing firms these days not only provides the manufacturing services right it also provides uh, a, you know the service the services itself and some of the manufacturing for, for example if you are a, uh, you, using a water filter when you buy a water filter you're just not buying a water filter a filter but you're also signing an annual maintenance contract right amc where the company is actually providing a service so a lot of services enter into the gvcs so services in the uh, value chain uh, is it's it's becoming very common so it is a kind of a value addition uh, which is also services you can think uh, in terms of uh, you know adding an extra infrastructure to the firms and uh, services is now becoming a, a kind of an intermediate input uh, uh, in the manufacturing especially when it comes to the distribution marketing and after sales so uh, where, where uh, you know big companies like amazon is using a robot arm in the packaging or uh, if you see that uh, a korean company cgin developed the covid uh, kit in 3 weeks and uh, the results are available in 3 hours because they don't use the human production technique they use the uh, the robotic technique so the, the adoption of this kind of automation by you know the especially the service for the service oriented firms this is really important uh the, the, this can actually help them in substantially improving their productivity so so for example the world development report uh, based on which this study is actually uh, inspired is that the automation technologies can sort of it can aid the uh, trade by reducing the logistic cost and the uh, red tapes so there are you know few studies which actually looked at the role of industry 4.0 uh, and then uh, they they show that all these uh, uh, new age technologies has a kind of a deep impact on the supply chain management and improving their efficiency etc especially these uh, uh, you know the robotics 3d printing or other kind of uh, automation technologies so uh, <clears throat> so if you look at the uh, uh, global value chains where there is constant interaction between the you know the suppliers right the firms that supply these intermediate inputs uh, uh, before it becomes a final product so uh, especially the industry 4.0 is going to have a big impact on the business to business applications so we are actually live, uh, going to live or probably living in an age where the data is the gold mine and the real time data is what is going to play an important role which will help the firms in understanding the wear and tear of the especially the sensor technologies uh, which is actually going to make a, a uh, you know big change uh, in uh, enabling the firm to identify their wear and tear in the equipment so uh, uh, moving on uh if you look at the i've been talking about the role of industry 4.0 and then how the supply chain literature has been looking at this uh from a trade perspective i mean uh, of course as i mentioned in the beginning there are certain concerns which are raised in uh that the automation is likely to lead to the reshoring not the offshoring uh, uh but then a few studies i mean like a recent study uh by stapleton and webb which is using an form level data for spain which has actually shown that instead of reshoring what we are actually seeing is an adoption of these kind of automated technologies leading to an imports uh, from the lower income countries 
So instead of the you know all these production going back to the home country, what we are seeing is the trade is actually going up as a result of this uh, automation technology. So similarly, Artuk uh, developed a kind of a general equilibrium model and then tested this with the Mexican data. And then they proved that in the theoretical model that the robot adoption in the north has reduced the production cost. And also what has happened is it has led to the uh, level of imports from the south. So it, it, they, they show theoretically and empirically that the, the trade doesn't uh, get reduced as a result of the adoption of automation technologies. So, uh, <clears throat> and this is further, uh, you know, uh, enhanced by the uh, these kind of an argument uh, is again highlighted in the world development report where they argue that the report actually says that these production technologies enhance the gvc participation so where we are actually trying to uh, you know sort of uh, pitch in is uh, trying to understand the impact of this automation on the trade which is you know still a new kind of an issue so to study this uh, what we rely is on a, a database which is very popular these days, the World Bank Enterprise Survey database. So those who are not very familiar with the uh, WBS database, it's, it's a database which is freely downloadable. Uh, you go to the World Bank Enterprise Surveys.org, all data is available freely for download. So the World Bank actually conducts uh, these surveys uh, across 144 countries. So these are not carried out uniformly. So the, they, they release the survey uh, based on the availability of uh, once the survey is carried out, they release it not simultaneously together. So, and then this is not really, uh, uh, it's a kind of a cross-sectional uh, survey because in the uh, we don't have a panel element so far. Uh, the same firms are not surveyed even if you have two or three rounds of uh, uh, the surveys for the same country itself. So it provides uh, uh, information. It's a, it's a very exhaustive database. It contains a lot of information about the finance, uh, uh, including certain issues like corruption. Uh, uh, and then these are basically questions which are answered by somebody in the firm who is actually uh, responding to the government. So it provides a lot of information about sales, exports, uh, in, inputs, you know, the bribery, uh, employment, all those things are available. And then uh, they follow a stratified random sampling uh, uh, using the location, size and sector with the replacement technique. And these are basically face-to-face -face interviews with the managers or the owners of the firm. And uh, it, it's not just a manufacturing survey. This survey contains both the manufacturing and the services sector. So WBS uh, data, even though it is available from 2001 onwards, from 2006 only, they started having a kind of a, a questionnaire, uh, which is standardized so that, you know, it, it makes it easy for uh, a comparison purpose across countries. But uh, for our purpose, the automation information is available only from 2016 onwards. So the analysis, what we are going to uh, do, or what I'm going to show is confined to this particular three years, 2016 and uh, 19. So uh, one thing to keep in uh, mind is that there is no possibility of having a panel of firms. Because even if the, uh, uh, the, they do the same kind of a survey in the same country, it's very unlikely that the same form will be surveyed again. So difficult to have a kind of a panel structure. Uh, uh, so, so that's something which needs to be uh, you know, kept in mind. So uh, after getting this raw data, what we did was the, we uh, sort of engaged in a kind of a data cleaning exercise like a typical form level data. There may be some observations which are missing. So we sort of deleted the missing observation, especially for those firms which are not reporting sales. And also we drop uh, uh, those countries and industries which have less than five uh, automators in the sample. So after all these uh, data cleaning purpose, we have a cross section of 20 countries uh, 
uh, over the period 20, 2016 to 19 uh, with around 3570 from your observation so uh, the the automation variable uh, moving on to the variable description the automation variable is not easy to uh, identify because the uh, it's a kind of a descriptive question for example the question h6 contains this uh, question that please describe in detail the main new or the improved process this establishment introduced during the last three years okay so what uh, it's a kind of a uh, you know a sub subjective question where the respondent have to answer so they provide a brief uh, description about the process they have adopted so for example just want to highlight uh, these are some of the uh, responses like for manufacturing uh, uh, the automation of the production process the replacement of people with robots at certain points uh, or introduce the new way of offloading uh, crude palm oil or uh, these are some of the responses. The new order movement of materials in the automation of manual operations, changing the supply chain. For the services sector, it's logistic processes for the customers. So we had to identify uh, uh, using certain keywords uh, like automation, 3D printing, robots, etc. So, so what we did is we kind of did a, a kind of a text analysis to uh, derive this automation variable. So the, our automation variable is a kind of a binary variable. Uh, which is equal to one if the firm has automated any of its tasks uh, or introduced robots and zero otherwise, right? So we used a certain keywords like automation, robotization, 3D printing, uh, advanced manufacturing, etc., uh, to identify or to arrive at this kind of uh, uh, information. So we can see that uh, uh, there are 20 countries in our uh, sample and then uh, 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 we have a total of 3,570 uh, uh, forms, as uh, 3,570 uh, uh, 3, forms. Uh, uh. So uh, this is how we actually arrive at the uh, automation variable. Now, coming to our uh, global value chain, uh, the global value chain is again at the form level is a kind of a, uh, a tricky issue. How do we define it? Uh, the, most of the studies, in fact, the next paper is going to also talk about GVC, but uh, I think it's about the sectoral definition. But GVC uh, at the farm level is a tricky issue to be defined. So what we follow is basically a, a standard definition, which is now very popularly used in the literature is GVC firms are those which are, you know, simultaneously exporting and importing. So the idea is that, uh, the idea of this definition is that the GVC is a process where the value addition of the final product or the, uh, the final product is components are sourced from at least two countries. So therefore the GVC uh, is also a dummy variable where we define GVC firm as uh, those which has an international quality certification and those which are exporting and importing simultaneously. And alternatively, just to check the robustness of our result, we also use a, an alternative measure where we make a stringent definition of the uh, GVC uh, by including another criteria that it's not just a, a two-way trader with a quality certification, but also a technology license from a foreign company. And uh, if this is not fulfilled, then uh, it's a non-GVC form. So uh, coming to our descriptive statistics, you can actually see that from this particular table that uh, around 14% of our sample firms are uh, uh, GVC firms and the automation adopters are roughly uh, 4%. And this is not very unusual. For example, those, uh, uh, for those studies which have actually looked at individual country experiences uh, also have similar kind of uh, data for the automation. And around 11% of our uh, sample firms are foreign firms. So when it comes to the more stringent definition of our GVC variable, we have roughly uh, around 5% uh, of the firms are uh, GVC firms. When you include that stringent definition of uh, GVC. So some stylized facts. So we have uh, data uh, for the lower middle income, upper middle income, and the uh, 
high income uh, countries so so for example you can actually see that uh, the latvia uh, uh, lithuania and uh, slovenia in the high income categories have more forms adopting uh, automation whereas in the lower middle income country uh, the moldova or uh, uh, bolivia and in the case of upper middle income country peru have the highest automation and also if you look at the automation uh, across industries as expected that uh, automation is uh, mo most mostly concentrated in you know few sectors especially in this particular case we can see that it's the telecommunication or the medical equipments uh, or the motor vehicles and transport equipment so there is a kind of uh, a expected kind of a this uh, you know result what we are getting the automation is at present is mostly confined to uh, you know on certain uh, sectors which are uh, already well known where these are uh, automated so uh, when it comes to our empirical analysis i mean like uh, our database is uh, uh, slightly different in the sense that you have forms which are basically uh, located in a country and this is a cross country database so to account for this kind of nature of the database what we resort is and instead of doing the standard uh, you know probit or logit model we use the multi level uh, models and these kind of models are very popular in the uh, health literature or in the education literature because of the data clustering so uh, the multi level models are very useful uh, in overcoming the independence assumption because a firm located in a country will be experiencing uh, or a part of a, uh, a unique uh, environment in which they operate which is different from another country which has a unique uh, environment so the clustering of the data uh, this is uh, since our data is basically a kind of a clustered data so uh, multi level models is more suited to analyze this kind of a database so uh, to, to test our uh, hypothesis we rely on the multi level probit model so uh, due to the clustering the standard idea of independence assumption in the traditional regression model gets violated so once you ignore this nested data structure of the data you will see that there will be an underestimation of the standard errors and an excellent reference for this uh, multi level model is the gua and uh, shaw's book and uh, uh, previously some of the studies which used this the world bank enterprise survey database also have uh, employed the multi level models which also inspired us to undertake uh, uh, the multi level modeling instead of this uh, traditional uh, you know the models so if you look at the uh, our model uh, so we are modeling gvc as a function of the automation and then we control for certain form level controls uh, and uh, so the equation describes a, a kind of a two level hierarchical models one is basically at one level the observations which are uh, the forms uh, that is the first level and then we have certain uh, level 2 is basically at the country level since the forms are nested within a country so uh, so z is basically the form specific uh, controls uh, and also we also include certain macro level controls uh, uh, information related to uh, per gross domestic product and the ease of doing business which we are actually uh, taken from the world development indicators right so this parameter uh, rho j is uh, represented uh, or they represent the unobserved factors at the country level so which can uh, show the differential level of automation adoption across the different countries so it's a two level multi level models we have two levels one at the form level and one at the country level uh, you might ask why uh, we could have had it at the industry level and make it a three level model but because the uh, the number of observations are relatively small you know we decided to opt for the two level uh, multi level model so we begin by you know estimating the single level model uh, the linear probability model and the standard a probit model before we move to the multi level uh, means the multi level two level model so you can actually see that irrespective of the linear probability model or the probit model or the uh, multi level linear probability model the automation has a 
a positive and a significant influence on the gvc participation right but then uh, this kind of modeling actually doesn't take into account the clustering of our database so therefore what we do is uh, we move on to the multi level profit uh, uh, model a uh, two level model uh, which takes into account the clustering of our data so you can see that uh, the lr test which actually shows the superiority of the multi level two level uh, uh, probit is more superior to the traditional uh, probit model and also the icc is the indra uh, indra class uh, correlation coefficient which actually show how much is the heterogeneity in terms of the countries is able to explain the automation decision so you can actually see that it varies from 13% to you know 25% uh, is the country level heterogeneity uh, so that's kind of substantial so if you look at the uh, the automation so we can see that uh, the the if you, these are marginal effects okay the, uh, all these uh, whatever is reported is the marginal effects so uh, so it's it's basically this coefficient says that the variation is basically from 5% to you know as high as 7% and you can see that these these are actually these marginal effects are actually smaller than what we actually get from the traditional probit uh, or the linear probability models which which actually shows that uh, you know there is an overestimation uh, or there is some bias which is involved in the traditional probit model uh sorry to interrupt but uh, you have around you can take around 5 minutes yo that's fine that's fine yeah, yeah. so then uh, uh, one of the key issues uh, uh, in in the econometric modeling is basically the endogeneity issues so uh, <clears throat> so the the one of uh, a common uh, issue is with regard to the unobserved heterogeneity and uh, there is a possibility that the forms which are uh you know they are self selecting to the automation in the sense that it's most likely that the more productive forms are likely to adopt the automation techniques so what we did is the standard procedure is using a propensity score matching where we have a, a set of treated uh, forms which are automated forms and then you have some uh, counterfactual which are non automated forms and then we match based on some form specific characteristics like uh, uh size age uh, productivity ownership etc and then uh, we complement our matched samples right the first level is estimated using the uh, probit and then we generate the propensity score and using that we match uh, and then estimate using the multi level probit so that shows that our results are you know robust in the sense that the automation has a positive effect even after correcting for the endogeneity uh, aspect and further there is also a possibility of the reverse causality so so the, it's it's argued that the gvc can uh, serve as a channel for firms to get the advanced manufacturing technologies so uh, that the level of automation is driven by its integration so it can be like uh, more automated firms can become gvc firm or it can be gvc firms are more automated so in order to overcome this reverse causality what we did was we use an uh, iv approach where we obtain labor restriction as a kind of an instrument variable uh, because it's 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 likely that when the labor regulation is an obstacle it's more likely that the firms are uh, likely to automate their job uh, uh, jobs so uh, the so then we did an iv uh, uh, probit model uh, using this labor uh, regulation variable as an instrument and we also tried other instruments as well but the re results are robust like the gvc uh, participate uh, the automation has a positive effect on the uh, gvc participation and also just to just to enhance the quality of our finding we we also uh, resorted to estimating the lugal approach which is basically a technique used when you don't have an uh, instrument where the instruments are generated from the estimation process itself so the lugal uh, uh, method also gives a strength to our results where the automation variable is still uh, you know positive and significant and then uh, we also looked at uh, you know whether the 
the reinforcement of the productivity channel, which has an influence on the uh, GVC participation is reinforced through the automation. So what we did was, uh, <clears throat> we just interacted our uh, productivity variable with the automation uh, and then re-estimated the model. So we can see that, uh, uh, that productivity channel is uh, playing a key role uh, or just sorry. So, so the automation, uh, so, so, so we, we, we interacted the automation variable with our measure of productivity and we see the same kind of a result emerging, telling that uh, the, the reinforcement of uh, productivity happens through the uh, automation. Then further, uh, given the, uh, the time, paucity of time, we also did the same kind of uh, exercise using the alternate uh, definition of GVC, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and we get the similar kind of a result. And then we sort of removed those industries which are highly automated and see whether this is actually uh, leading to uh, any change in the result. So we, we excluded the topmost robotized sectors and re-estimated and we see that the automation still has a positive influence on the uh, GVC participation. So just to conclude, uh, so the, the firms which are adopting automation techniques are having definitely an advantage towards the integration in the GVC. And of course, uh, I did not show the result. Uh, uh, we also did a similar kind of a uh, check whether it's only the large firms which are benefiting or is it the small and medium firms are also the beneficiaries of this automation. So it's not just uh, the large firms uh, uh, the adoption of automation by uh, only the large firms, but the automation is also, or the positive impact of automation is also experienced by the small and medium firms. So, so what we argue is that uh, the automation is a kind of uh, uh, an edge uh, in the international pro uh, internationalization process of the firms. So with this, I am ending the uh, presentation. So uh, of course, you know, a caveat to be borne in mind is that we are using the automation identification from the year 2016 only. So some of the countries like China and few East Asian economies are not included, but if you include probably this finding is going to be strengthened only. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, it was a very- Sorry, uh, so, sorry Digvijay for exceeding the time. No, no, no problem. So uh, there is one question uh, in the question answer box by Somesh Mathur. Can you see it or should I? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can see that Borin and Mancini have used input output tables to calculate GVCs. Should India participate more in foreign exports or harbor foreigners in our exports? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what, uh, uh, the, the, uh, of course, this paper is not about India, but this is an India specific uh, question. I think this is what. Uh, the economic survey, there was a chapter written by Professor Viramani last year, which actually, uh, uh, you know, sort of gave a very interesting picture about, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, some of the East Asian economies and China, the India's integration with the GVZ is still low. And then It, it, it's time or probably this is an opportunity for India to move up the GVC ladder because the China is moving up the GVC ladder. So where the China is vacating, probably India can take the place. And then uh, uh, using the, I don't know whether the question is related to the use of input output tables to calculate GVC. Uh, I think that's just a comment. Okay. But given this data, uh, uh, I mean, it's not possible to incorporate input output tables uh, to the GVC. Uh, so therefore the, 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 the best available, the next best alternative is basically defining these GVC firms are those which are, you know, two way traders, those who are exporting and those who are importing inputs, right? Of course, uh, we have another paper uh, for India, myself and uh, Ketan where we have actually sort of 
uh, integrated this, uh, that's an India specific paper where we have actually integrated this India input output tables with the, you know, the farm level data. But in this data, uh, it's and given the cross country nature of the data, it's it's uh, probably it's 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 difficult to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Dr. Neha. Uh, Neha, you have forty minutes. Uh, before you begin, I'll just briefly introduce you. Uh, so Neha Betai is an academic associate in the economics and social sciences area at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. She has a master's degree in applied economics from the Center for Development Studies, Trivandrum. Her main area of research are uh, international economics, trade and, and trade and migration studies. So Neha, you, uh, Neha, you can start now. Uh, all the attendees, you can, uh, all your questions, you can type it up in the question and answer box. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, is it visible? Yes. It's yeah. Okay. Great. So the paper that I'm going to be presenting today is something that Professor Rupa and I quite recently worked on. Uh, it's global value chain participation and intermediate export sophistication, wherein we're basically trying to see the impact of globalization of production processes, internationalization of production process on the channel through which we participation, participate in global value chains, which is our intermediate export. So when we're talking about, um, yeah, so when we're talking about globalization, uh, the entire history of globalization has been divided into two parts by Professor Richard Baldwin. It's called the first unbundling of trade and the second unbundling. In the first unbundling, uh, we had a reduction, it was prompted by a reduction in cost of transportation. Before this first unbundling, production and consumption were always located quite close to each other. Uh, except for maybe spices and a few luxury goods, people generally consumed what was produced locally. Uh, however, when the cost of transportation reduced due to steam engine revolution and other advancements in tra uh, transport technology, uh, production could now be located far away from the consumption hubs. However, as consumption was being separated from production, there was production in itself was clustering and it led to the formation of manufacturing clusters. These manufacturing clusters came up because of very high cost of coordination. Because it was better to be located close to your intermediate input suppliers or to your suppliers of raw material uh, because back then it wasn't very easy to communicate. However, when the ICT revolution took place, this uh, constraint on uh, coordination costs with ease. So there was a decline in cost of co uh, coordination as a result of which you are not only, there was a breakdown of the entire production process. You could now be located very far away from your intermediate input suppliers and still coordinate with them and get your inputs properly. This is what gave rise to global value chains. And when you talk about global value chains and internationalization of production, this is evident from the gradual increase in foreign value added content of your exports. Also, rise in GVCs implies that there is an increase in the importance of intermediate goods because you're no longer uh, uh, producing and exporting finished products. Today, if you look, no product will be completely manufactured in one country. You import intermediate goods, you work on them, and then you export it further. According to some studies, over 50% of the trade in goods and over 70% of the trade in services today is just an intermediate input. What has been the impact of this internationalization, this GVC participation? Now, there are studies which show that it has led to poverty reduction, it has led to increase in income. What we're trying to focus on today is one very particular aspect of economic uh, performance, which is upgrading and sophistication. So what we're trying to do in this paper is see how participation in GVCs has led to upgrading and productivity improvement in intermediate exports, which I mentioned earlier, are the main channels through which countries participate in GVCs. So this is the format of the presentation. In the literature review, what, are, what we're gonna to try to do is identify the channels through which GVC participation affects your exports. We've identified four channels. Uh, the first one is scale effects, specialization and demand effects. This idea refers to the fact that if you have a higher number of markets to cater to, your specialization in a set uh, in a commodity is going to improve. 
there are studies which show that most productive firms in an economy are those which serve the highest number of markets in fact productivity growth sophistication and even probably upgrading is related to your export intensity the higher the share of your output that you export the more likely you are to benefit from participation in import export and gvc activities also because under gvc there is a very fine division of labor because your production process is so fragmented there is a magnification of gains because of this very fine division of labor next with uh, the next channel is knowledge diffusion through fdi and outsourcing now upgrading can take place when an mnc has backward linkages this means that mnc is willing to transfer a part of its production process along with technology to suppliers in other countries especially in the emerging market economies so the suppliers in emerging market economies now have access to better technology and they can uh, produce better goods and maybe even more advanced goods fdi does not only lead to transfer of technological know how or tangible technology it also leads to transfer of soft skills such as management and organization skills uh moreover there is also evidence for indirect technology transfer through fdi one study finds that if you're located in a city that receives a lot of fdi even though you personally aren't receiving any fdi i mean the firm if, if it's given if the firm is not receiving any fdi the firm will still gain from it the firm will still experience an increase in productivity moreover the firms that are outsourcing also benefit from it the mnc said outsource also benefit from it because now they do not have to focus on production of these goods they can transfer their entire cost saving that takes place on their core competencies this is what apple does apple has offshored most of its production centers to other emerging market economies and it now focuses mainly on r&d in us next is r&d spillovers uh Uh, now r and d spillovers can take place when you import goods from other countries because these imported goods uh, especially intermediate goods and capital products embody a lot of technology and information so when you import goods you get access to this embodied knowledge and this is how r and d that has taken place in another country gets transferred however this absorption of knowledge and knowledge diffusion through this channel depends on where you are relative to the technology frontier if you are too close to the frontier you may not benefit that much because it means that you do not have enough technology to absorb but at the same time if you are too far away from the frontier it means that your, the gap that you have with the technology frontier is too large so you do not have the necessary technology that is required to absorb the advanced technology uh the next channel is trade and input uh when you trade in inputs there is an increase in the availability of foreign inputs which can increase productivity uh, uh the number of inputs that were previously inaccessible increases which can promote cost saving and improvement of quality uh there is also improvement of productivity when you import goods because it increases competition in the local markets produ- uh, forcing your producers to be more uh, productive next is uh, also when you import foreign inputs foreign inputs can be quite technologically advanced which means that you require that your employment your employees have enough skills to work with these technologically advanced foreign inputs thus foreign inputs can increase the skill level in an economy by promoting changes in the employment structure upgrading can also take place like i mentioned earlier due to the knowledge embodied in inputs 